All right, you turn with me to Daniel chapter number 8. Daniel chapter number 8, we'll be there today. So I remember in, in high school, I had an opportunity to go on a missions trip over to Kenya in Africa. And part of what we were doing was set up a dental clinic so people could come in uh, to that dental clinic. But then a big part of this was also uh, while they're waiting for their turn in the chair, uh, we'd go out and, and preach to them, share the gospel. So I was there and I had the opportunity to go share to this group under this kind of thatched roof, open-sided hut. And so I'm there speaking through an interpreter. And you know, being about 17, 18 at the time, I think everybody's like, I came to get my teeth fixed, not listen to this American kid. <laughs> and so they all kind of just decided maybe they had better things to do with their time. And so some of them just start kind of walking away, leaving um, to go other places. And it was as if just, boom, somebody flipped a switch, this monsoon happened. So, I mean, rain just comes down from the sky and everybody's kind of trying to walk away and they kind of decided, well, is it better to get soaked or go listen to the American kid? Okay, I'll go back. And so all these people like actually come back and eight or nine of those individuals actually came to accept Christ. And I remember going back to the room that night and just kind of getting on my knees and thinking, only God. And I was just a vessel. I was just there preaching the gospel but it was one of those moments in my life where I, I knew, I mean, that was just so apparent that God had sent that rainstorm and these people had to come back and listen to the gospel. And I imagine that you have some moments in your life where you could say, only God. And in Daniel chapter number eight, there's, there, there's going to be a theme of prophecy, of seeing things that only God could do. And I, so I love this chapter and let's dive in together. So if you're joining us for the first time for the Daniel Manual, or it's been a little while, here's, here's the big idea for our series. We find ourselves in an increasingly secular culture that demands our attention and our absolute allegiance. So how should we live in such a time as this? Well, let's learn from Daniel, who was an Old Testament prophet and statesman who prayed for and provided wisdom to at least four kings and two competing and diverse empires. So here's the Daniel Manual for living in such a time as this. Of course, we're in chapter number eight. Um, so just briefly in re review, remember at the beginning of the book, this is the end of the dream for the Jews. They had their place in Palestine, they're in Israel, and it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar or any other foreign power that came in and conquered them. It was actually God that gave them into the hand of Babylon. And so Daniel has now been in exile for a long period of time, this passage is going to pick up. He's, he's actually still in Babylon. And chapters 1 through 6 are a narrative of his ministry to foreign kings. And we kind of finished up chapter number 6. It's that famous story of Daniel in the lion's den. We kind of summed up that whole part of, of the book as saying that the lions watched him from the first time he walked down the processional way into Babylon until the time in the lion's den. The lions watched him, but the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, watched over him. And then in chapter number seven, the book switched from this kind of narrative into apocalyptic or prof, uh, prophetic part of the book. And we talked about how Daniel is, in a sense, a, a double chiasm, which is this literary device where an idea is explained, but then repeated in reverse order. Because if you're reading the book kind of chronologically, we are already into the Persian Empire, and then it skips back into the time of Babylon. You're thinking, well, why is that? Well, it's because this is a very sophisticated piece of literature teaching something important. Now, just briefly, we, we talked about chapter 7, which, wow, that was a lot, all right? Chapter 7 is a lot, and it includes a story or, or a dream that Daniel has about these four beasts. We talked about kind of the majority view of those, those empires ending in Rome and kind of a minority view of, it, of that last empire being Greece, but the, the story is the same. Chapter 7 includes the most important moment in human history where Jesus Christ is invested or inaugurated as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we talked about how Jesus, when he's standing in front of the high priest, uh, being tr he's on trial. Jesus, when he's asked, are you the son of the blessed? Are you God? He responds, I am, the covenant name of God, but then refers back to Daniel 7 and, and, and says, you high priest will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. This direct reference back to Daniel 7 and so he's telling the high priest, you know that reference to the king of kings and lord of lords, I'm standing right in front of you. And that's when the high priest rips his clothes, blasphemy. And that brings us to chapter number eight. In chapter number eight, if you look there in verse number one, it says this. 
In the third year of the king Belshazzar, Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me, even unto Daniel, after that which appeared unto me at the first. And I saw a vision, and it came to pass when I saw, and that I was at Shushan in the palace, which is in the province of Elam, and I saw in a vision, and I was by the river of Uli. All right, so Daniel 7 took, uh, takes place, it says, in the first year of the reign of King Belshazzar. All right, chapter 8 says that it's, this happens in the third year of King Belshazzar. Belshazzar, remember, is the last king of Babylon. He's the one that is having the drunken party, and God comes and writes on the wall, and he's not long for this world. So historians believe that if, if you're looking at Belshazzar's reign, that these visions uh, in 7 probably happened in 550 or 549 B.C., and then this vision happened in 548 or 547 B.C. So we know kind of exactly, the Bible tells us, here's exactly when this happened. And then it's also fascinating, the Bible actually tells us the vision um, to Daniel is in a specific spot. And so where, kind of, where is that? If the Bible tells us where this is, then, uh, well, it's probably significant. So I thought we'd, we'd talk just for a second about where this occurred. All right, so Daniel at the time is in Babylon, and he's saying that he's being transported in this vision over to Shushan, or to Susa, which was the capital of Persia. So Daniel's sitting in Babylon, he's a government official in Babylon, and the vision of, is of the next great empire that's going to come on the world stage, but it hasn't happened yet. And it says that he's there by the, the river of Uli. And so and it's by Shushan in the palace. If you've read the book of Esther, you, you've heard the mention of, of the place Shushan. And so he's saying it's, it's right here. So we know from this particular city, and so what I love about Daniel is we're talking about specific dates, specific places. All right, and so in the city of Shushan, you had the royal city, um, the palace of the king, and they had dug out this canal, the Uli Canal, that kind of went around the city and helped irrigate it, but also protect it from attack. And so this is actually what it looks like today. Um, the Uli Canal is pretty much dried up. There's not as much water as there was in biblical times. And so you can kind of see the, the royal city was up there. Here's the Uli Canal and a, 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 the lower city. And so this is where kind of Daniel is transported. It's, I was just thinking about, you remember the Disney story about Aladdin and his magic carpet ride? Like, this has nothing. That's got nothing on Daniel. Okay, Daniel's got this major vision, and he's transported all the way from Babylon over to, to Shushan. And it's interesting that God is speaking in dreams. And think about your own dreams. Like, are, are your own dreams always very logical? No, sometimes you see a clown, like, with a head on his, uh, with a fish on his head or something. I mean, you, your dreams sometimes are kind of here and there. And so God chooses this medium to share these visions with Daniel. Now it's important. Note the dates, all right? 550, 549, 548, 547. Because what Daniel is about to, to tell us about, he's about to share this vision of events that are going to happen hundreds of years in the future. So this is important. First thing, a kind of first point, a big idea here this morning, is the ram and the goat, all right? So if you've studied this particular passage, you, you know that there are these two animals that are portrayed. And what's nice about chapter number eight is we don't have to guess about which kingdom it is because the Bible actually tells us <laughs> in the passage that, that Jonah read and actually says, look, the ram is Persia and the goat is Greece. So a couple of, I'm going to read a through a couple of these verses and I'm going to give some kind of historical commentary as we're going through this. Now, if you didn't like history in school, let me explain why I think this is important for us. Okay, two reasons. The first one is that we're now studying events. So Daniel's getting this download, this vision of the future from God, and he's, he's going to hear about events that are going to happen way into the future. And so only God could do that. But also we're going to see the, the care with which God directs the destiny of nations. And if God takes that type of care to direct the destiny of nations, then surely he takes the same care in directing our own lives. And so as you see this, it's kind of the reverse of what uh, Franklin said at the beginning of our country, which he said, you know, if, if God is, is aware of when a sparrow falls from its nest, surely he's involved in the rise of empires. So the reverse is true as well. If he's invested in the rise of empires, he also cares for your life. So look at how carefully God describes these things. 
Verse number three, Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. The two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. Remember, we spent a long time talking about the Medes and the Persians. The Medes were the power first, but then under Cyrus the Great, the Persians came up last. Cyrus is the one that en ends up conquering much of the known world. Now, it's interesting. The, this idea of horns, all right, you have horns on the goat, you have horns on the ram, you're kind of like, well, why are we talking about horns? Well, I think for us here in Indiana, just think about antlers, all right? When you kill a deer, do you mount its hooves? Uh, no, all right, do you mount its head? Oh, this deer has a really large head. No, we mount the antlers. Why? Because the antlers are a sign of the power and strength of the deer, all right? It's the, the carrots in there and the, the proteins that make this a hard substance, and so the Bible is saying that these horns are kind of a, a symbol of their power and might. And uh, Marcellinus, who is a 4th century historian, said that the Persian kings would actually have a ram's head, either on a staff or maybe even on a headdress, that they would wear at the, the head of their armies. In verse number 4, I saw the ram pushing westward. The Persians attacked the Greeks to the west. Northward, the Persians attacked the Scythians to the north. And southward, the Persians attacked the Egyptians to the south so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that would deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. So the Persian Empire is the world's first kind of truly global superpower. In fact, history, if we understand it correctly, is that the Persian Empire ruled over a greater percentage of humanity than any other empire, something like 44%. Almost half the world was under their dominion. And they ruled, if you can just kind of see this on, in a map here, from India to Egypt to Greece. And here, again, it's an historical empire. Here are some of the ruins from Persepolis, their capital city, um, that we can see today. Now, you may ask, well, how did they become so powerful? And I find this somewhat interesting. I, I think it is relevant uh, as we get into Greece as well. How did this empire become so strong? Well, they modified the tactics of former empires and put in something like 25 to 30% more archers. And so one, one source said that if you had an army of about 50,000 Persians, most of them would be archers. And you think about, oh, you know, what's the big deal? of They're just shooting arrows. No, just a second. All right, so if you had 20,000 archers that had a range of up to 200 yards, they could shoot approximately 100,000 arrows a minute. And in 20 minutes, they would have shot approximately 2 million arrows. If you're on a horse, you're dead. If you don't have a shield, you're dead, okay? And there's this famous line from, uh, if you remember Thermopylae, which is where the Greeks stood up, the 300 Spartans stood up to the Persians. And there's this, supposedly this exchange between a Greek that comes running up to the Spartans. The like, Spartans, they shoot so many arrows that they blot out the sun. And what's the famous response? Great, then we'll fight in the shade. All right, it's this great, this great hoorah movement. But this is how the, the Persians took over the known world. I mean, they literally showered you with arrows. And so again, we, we find their Persia under Cyrus stretches all the way from India into Greece. And so at the time, it looked like Persia would take over everything. It would last for forever. And in fact, the Jews enjoyed religious liberty and, and some freedom. You think about the story of Nehemiah, the story of Esther. They're all under the Persian Empire. Next, the Bible turns to Greece, and it says in verse 5, And I was considering, behold, and he goat came from the west on the face of the whole earth, and touched not the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between his eyes. If you've studied history, you can probably guess who this is, right? It's Alexander the Great. This, this little horn is Alexander the Great. And it says that he didn't even touch the ground. Why? Because Neb or. Uh, Alexander the Great is going to conquer the Persian Empire from 334 B.C. to 331. Within just a few years, and it's not like you hop on a plane, you have to march everywhere you go, and he crushes the Persian Empire within just a few short years. And it says in verse number 6, And he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen before the river, and ran unto him in the fury of his power. Now, we know from history, Alexander the Great inherited this massive war machine that had been built by his father, Philip. And so if you can imagine, like you're born, uh, Philip gets assassinated, and he has this military machine, something like the German Wehrmacht in World War II. I mean, this thing was well-oiled. They had conquered the Greeks. Uh, Macedon is just north, north of Greece. And remember a little bit of the history. 
in between the Greeks and the Persians. The Persians had invaded Greece, then actually burned the city of Athens before they defeated Salamis. You, you think about Thermopylae, where they murdered Leonidas and the 300 Spartans. So these people don't like each other, all right? And so when it says that Alexander ran at them in the fury of his power, uh, Alexander was not Greek, but what he did to get the Greeks to come along is he framed the war against Persia as payback. We're going to go get revenge against the Persians. So all the Greeks are like, yeah, let's go do that. And so he comes at them in the fury of his power and ran into him. Verse number seven, and I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with collar against him and smote the ram and brake his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to, to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and stamped upon him. There was none that could de deliver the ram out of his hand. There was a piece of this that I, just how deeply, how intricately scripture describes this conquest. There was one piece of it that I had, had missed until I was studying it for this sermon. When Alexander the Great invaded Persia, he had an army of about 50,000 men. At the time, the king of Persia could muster about 2.5 million men. <laughs> right. And they, they ranged all the way from Ethiopia, all the way into India. And so Alexander, just kind of the, hub, the hubris of, of, I'm going to march into Asia with 50,000 men. Well, the first battle is at, at Issus. And the Greeks were doing poorly until Alexander, in the front of what it was called his companion cavalry, personally led the charge, crashing into the Persian lines. Darius flees. Um, Darius is always seen as kind of this coward. He flees. He leaves his own wife and children on the battlefield. That must have been an awkward conversation later on. <laughs> All right. And so Alexander, like personally, this is talking about this charging goat that doesn't even touch the ground. Well, what an amazing description as Alexander comes leading the charge, smashing into the Persian lines. Alexander goes into Egypt, conquers Egypt, and then meets Darius at the Battle of Gagamila. And at Gagam Gagamila, some estimates, Alexander's outnumbered at least two to one, 100,000 to 50,000. And you don't have grenades and artillery in hand, you know, you've got spears and bows. And the, the battle looks like it's going poorly. And in fact, there's this fascinating piece of the battle where the Greek soldiers see an elephant for the very first time. So if you can imagine, you're standing there with a sword and you know, a shield, and here comes this massive, <laughs> you've seen like drawings of these things, but now it's coming straight at you. And another kind of just fun element is historians believe that Alexander overslept on the morning <laughs> of the Battle of Cagamila. So it's like, Oh, we're going to fight the Persians. Like, where's Alexander? Oh, he's still sleeping. All right, come on, guys. Somebody get him up. We, we've got some important work to do. But the same, essentially the same thing happened in Gagamila. The left and the right of the, the, out of the Greek line gets pushed back, and the Persian center was exposed, and here comes Alexander at the front of his companion cavalry, smashes into the king's bodyguard called the 10,000 Immortals. Darius flees the battlefield. So can you see, the, again, we, we talked about when, when was this prophecy written? 548 to 547 B.C. When was the Battle of Gagamila? 331 B.C. 100, 200 years later. And here's God explaining to Daniel that this great Greek king is going to come flying out of rage and out of collar, and his feet aren't going to touch the ground, and with his rage he's going to come and smash into the Persians. It says in verse 7, again, that he... he smashed the ram, he trampled it, stamped it under the ground, all within just, again, a couple of years. It says in verse 8, Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for, for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And it says when the he-goat waxed very great, Alexander didn't just conquer territory. He attempted to Hellenize the world, meaning he tried to export Greek culture and importantly, Greek, lang Greek language. He thought he was doing it for his power and his glory. But let me ask you this question. Your Bible, the New Testament, in what language was it originally written? Your New Testament, was it written in Latin? No, not English either. It was written in Koine Greek, the common language. So Alexander thought he was conquering it for the might of of Greece, but he was actually paving the way for the spread of the gospel. And so 
You know, it says he waxed very great. When he was strong, it was broken. We know that he died at 32 of a kind of a strange disease. And as he was dying, he was asked, you know, who, who will succeed you? And the famous answer is, the strongest. And so after his death, his empire breaks into these four pieces. It says, came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. So these are called the, the Diadochi. So four of his generals, Cassander, uh, Lysimachus, and Seleucus take different parts of the empire. Most importantly for us today is Seleucus takes kind of Syria and the Middle East, and Ptolemy takes Egypt. And this, it says in verse 21 and verse tw number 22, I'm, I'm just kind of sharing with you what's said in the latter part of the chapter. It says, the rough goat is the king of Grecia. The, the horn that came up between his eyes the first king, now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up, but not in his power. All right, and so here's this remarkable, again, you may have studied this before, but as I just dug back into a little bit of the history, just how accurately Scripture describes, here's this massive superpower, 44% of the world's population, and here comes the, this Grecian king with 50,000 men and just smashes it and takes it down to the ground in just a few short years. No one could have seen that coming. The next thought and here is just an example of Alexander's conquest. He basically con conquered all of what was existing in Persia. And we talked a little bit last time about the Greek phalanx and how they're able to do that. You know, to the you know, two million arrows, the Greeks' response was, well, we have heavy armor and we have these massive spears. And the, the Persians, they had these light, like, wicker shields. And so if you can imagine a body of men like a tank coming at you, that's what happened to the Persian armies. Next thing I would say is the, the forgotten supervillain. The forgotten supervillain. In verse number nine, it says, And out of them, meaning these four horns, came a little horn, which ex waxed exceeding great towards the south, which was Egypt, toward the east, the Parthian Empire, and toward the pleasant land. So you think back to all of the supervillains, or the villains in, in Scripture. You think about Pharaoh in Egypt that wanted to, to keep the Jews there in exile in Egypt. You think about Herod, who killed the babies in Bethlehem. Like, we, we are like, these people are terrible. But there is this particular individual who is, I think, the worst villain in all of Scripture. But we don't often talk about him a lot because he's, he's here in this passage, maybe not so much mentioned in the New Testament. But his name is Antiochus Epiphanes. And I mentioned um, Solution and Ptolemaic lines here is an example of, of these two empires. And so you can see kind of up towards Syria, and this also went even further east, uh, was the Seleucid Empire. All right, so this govern or this general from Alexander's army, he takes over that part of the empire upon Alexander's death. And then Ptolemy takes over Egypt. Well, over time, these two empires fight against each other. In fact, when we get to Daniel chapter number 11, Scripture goes into incredible detail about the fighting in between these two empires. We'll get to that. But they're always kind of fighting back and forth. So Antiochus Epiphanes, he's the eighth in line after his father uh, Seleucus. You know, the, he's the eighth in line from um, Seleucus, so it would be however many great-great-grandsons uh, from Seleucus. And so he takes over the Seleucid Empire and reigned from 175 to 164. Josephus will say that the prophecies about this individual named Antiochus Epiphanes are the most detailed in all of Scripture. And so let's dig into this a little bit. It says that he waxed great, even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the hosts and of the stars to the ground. And Scripture, the, the hosts, the stars of the ground, are, are a reference to the Jews. Yea, he magnified himself, even to the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of the sanctuary was cast down. And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice, by reason of transgression, meaning the Jews' transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground and practiced and proffered. In verse number 23, again, so what's going to happen is in the chapter is that God gives Daniel the vision. He then, you know, begs for some help in trying to interpret it. And in verse number 23 comes the answer. In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and shall practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. It says in verse 25, And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. 
He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. All right, so here's, again, the eighth in line. He comes to the throne through some intrigue, and he takes the name Antiochus Epiphanes, which means incarnate one. So he literally claims to be an incarnate version of the Greek god Zeus. All right, so he, he claims to be God. Now, and to prove that, like, political memes and, you know, saying, kind of making fun of people in office isn't new in the United States. So he goes by Antiochus Epiphanes, which means the anointed or in, um, incarnate one. The people in his realm, especially the Jews, often called him Antiochus Epimenes, which means the man, the madman. Okay, so you can imagine there were a lot of little jokes, like Antiochus Epimenes, all right? <laughs> so he's the madman. And here's, here's what happened in his reign. So again, these, these two empires are fighting. Antiochus comes down and he conquers all of Egypt, except for Alexandria. And he has to come back into his empire to take care of something. And the Ptolemaic ruler in Alexandria, and there's a lot of moving parts here, but he appeals to Rome. And Rome is on the scene already. In fact, Rome had already beaten um, Antiochus III. And so Rome doesn't send an army. Rome sends an ambassador. And when Antiochus Epiphanes comes back with his army into Egypt. There's this old guy just sitting there, this ambassador. He's just standing there. And it's like, okay, here comes Antiochus. And he tells Antiochus, if you attack Alexandria, you will be at war with Rome. And the Senate demands your answer. And Antiochus is like, well, give me some time. And the, the man actually draws a line in the sand, a circle around Antiochus, and says, by the time you leave this circle, we demand your answer. So if you step out of this circle without telling me you're going back to Syria, we'll be at war. In fact, that's where we get our saying, drawing a line in the sand, all right? And Antiochus, he kind of wimps out. He says, well, we can't attack Rome. And so he takes his army back towards Syria. Well, where does he go? Where does he have to go on the way back to his empire? He has to go through Israel. Now, previously, what he was doing in Israel was trying to make the Jews Greek meaning he was trying to get them to take up Greek language, Greek religion, and what was going on at the time with the high priest. Now, we think of the high priest in Scripture as this very religious individual, and that was the case, but the high priest also became a civil ruler. And so what Antiochus was doing is whoever paid him the biggest bribe became the high priest. Now, that's spiritual, all right? Whoever's got the biggest pot of gold, you become the high priest. And so there's a guy named Jason who was, was trying to Hellenize the Greeks, make them Greek. He was building gymnasiums, sending people off to the Olympic Games. But he wasn't Greek enough. And so this guy named Menelaus takes over his position. Well, while Antiochus is down here in Egypt, Jason, this, this other high priest, comes in and kills a bunch of Menelaus' supporters, throws them out of office. And so Antiochus shows up in front of Jerusalem in a really bad mood, okay? <laughs> He's had a bad month, bad year, and he takes it out on the Jews. In December of 168, or in 168, he orders his general to attack Jerusalem on the Sabbath because he knows that the Jews won't fight back. And they plunder the place. They burn it. There are some, some sources that say that they killed at least 40,000 people and sold another 40,000 into slavery. Just to put that in context, here in Jefferson County, there's something like 32,000 to 35,000 people. So like everyone in our county, dead. And they didn't stop there because they ordered the Jewish people to change religions, basically. They outlawed Jewish practices like circumcision, the Sabbath, the keeping of the commandments, and they set up idols to Zeus. I mean, this is the holy city. This is Jerusalem. Can you imagine someone coming into our church, taking your Bible out of your hand, burning it, dropping something over this cross, symbol to another religion, and saying, bow, change, or you die? That is exactly what Antiochus did. And to kind of cap it all off, he goes into the Holy of Holies, goes into the Jewish temple on December 16th. We know the exact date he did this. December 16th of 167, and he offers a pig on the altar. This is the ultimate sacrilege. And Scripture will speak 
of an abomination of desolations uh, of the Antichrist in the future. This is kind of the forerunner of this. He literally goes into the Holy of Holies. And if you remember from the Scriptures, like how holy was this place? Well, the high priest only goes in there like once a year. And they tie a rope around his leg just in case he hasn't confessed something and God strikes him dead because he's there to offer a propitiation for the sins of the city of, or the people of, of Israel. So th- this is no light thing. And for the Jews, that was it. Like, okay, you, could, you, know, you can oppress us, you can what, make us pay taxes, but you sacrifice a pig on the altar, we're done. And so someone named Judas Maccabeus, uh, the Maccabean revolt, you may have, have read about it, he stands up. His nickname is the Hammer. And if you'd like to study something, the Maccabean Revolt is fascinating. He's this like, George Washington-like figure that fights against these really powerful armies. He's always one step ahead of them. And eventually, they're able to defeat the Seleucid army in Israel, take back Jerusalem, and restore worship. For uh, good old Antiochus Epiphanes, he's called over to the east to fight against the Parthians and he catches some sort of sickness and dies while he's on campaign in the east. Note that scripture, if you look there in verse number 13, it says, Then I heard one saint speaking, another saint said unto the other uh, which spake, How long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation and the host be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, Two thousand and three hundred days shall the sanctuary be cleansed. In in the original language there, there's kind of the concept of evening and morning. So there's some disagreement whether this is a 1,150 days or 2,300 days. But we do know um, from history that, again, that pig was put on the altar in 167. They were no longer able to offer sacrifices. And then something like in late 164, worship in the temple is restored. And so we don't know the exact date. But certainly when Scripture says, look, it'll be 2,300 days, we know from history that that's true. That it's, it, there's a lot of history to support that particular piece of Scripture. There's another piece of this that I did want to emphasize, and it's this. Throughout that passage, you, I mean, these are terrible things. 40,000, at least 40,000 people die. Some people think that altogether Antiochus is responsible for the death of something like 100,000 Jews. And you, these are terrible things. But back to even the beginning of the book, why was, why was Daniel in captivity? Because of the sin, the transgression of Israel. You think, well, how terrible that. I mean, you know, God, God is allowing these terrible things to happen. No, God is a God that is both perfectly just, meaning there has to be consequence for sin. You think, well, why is that? Well, if someone murdered someone in your family, shouldn't there be justice? Shouldn't there be justice? God is a God of justice. But he's also a God of mercy. And you think about what, what are the Jews doing? I mean, for one example, the high priest, the person that is supposed to represent the Jewish people to God himself, is the guy that pays this foreign pagan king the most money. Do we need to know much more than that? And so it says their transgression was full. And this was God's judgment upon them. There's one other piece of this. If you've ever heard of the, the story of Hanukkah, or the Jewish celebration of Hanukkah, this this is actually a celebration of these events. Because when Judah came back and took over the temple, there was a a candelabra there in the temple. There was only enough oil to burn for one day, but they couldn't find any oil. And that oil supposedly burned for eight days. And so when you see someone in the Jewish tradition celebrating that, that's what they're they're celebrating. I I come, as I finish this point, I come to Antiochus, and I, I... I kind of have two thoughts about this. First, I don't know if you've ever done something stupid in your life, all right? I, maybe we're, we all do something dumb every once in a while. But like, how dumb do you have to be, okay? Like, to go into the Holy of Holies, all right? The, the altar that God himself, Jehovah, the God that created the world, and to not just, like, offer a sacrifice to some other God. No, what was he doing? He called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, the incarnate one. So he, he worships himself in the Holy of Holies. 
Like, to, to God, this is something less than a mosquito, like, buzzing by the ear of the Almighty. But here he is, I'm God, I'm going to worship myself. Like, how dumb do you have to be? Like, what do you expect to happen? All right, do you think your life is going to go better from then on? Like, how dumb, how dumb do you have to be to offer a sacrifice to yourself in the Holy of Holies? But the more I've studied this, there's actually something else going on. And it says in Scripture that he's pow- his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. Whose power was animating him? Who was driving him to this ridiculous... He is the Epiphanes Epimenes. He is the madman. But why is he doing it? Because he's driven by the enemy of our souls to worship himself. And isn't that how Satan has always said it? Eat of the fruit. You'll be like God. Satan doesn't ask us to bow down to idols. Satan asks us to bow down to ourselves. That's what he's done for forever. And so this is, this is what inclines him, inspires him to do this. And as I've talked about this a, a few times in our series, we think, oh, yeah, I'm never going to go into the Holy of Holies and offer a sacrifice to myself. But what does it say in 1 Corinthians 6, 19? What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? What is our culture today saying? This is my body. I get to do with it whatever you want. God, you don't get to tell me what to do with it. And this can even affect us as Christians. So when we say, this is my body, God, you don't get to tell me what to do with my life, my sexuality. You don't get to, that is not your province. This is mine. Are we not doing something akin to Antiochus? And I'm trying to be as just gentle here as possible, but are we not doing something similar to going into the Holy of Holies and saying, I know, God, this is your, your temple, but I'm going to worship myself. Right. And so we insult the very image of God. Last point here I wanted to go through, and this is just a, a picture of him, and also we have coinage of Antiochus. Number three is the dark dream. I'm going back just a little bit in the passage, but there's some things here I wanted to point out. And it says, And it came to pass, in verse 15, when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision, sought for the meeting, then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision." And he says, while he's speaking to me, I was in a deep sleep, but he touched me and set me upright. And he said, behold, I'll make thee know what shall be in the latter end of the indignation. Going down to verse 26. This is after the explanation of Antiochus. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. Then I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. A few quick things that just jump out to me from this passage is this, there's apparently a saint talking to another saint, and then this Daniel says, I, I need to know, all right, I need, you, you gave me the vision two years ago, now here's this vision, please help me to understand what's going on. What am I supposed to do with this? And it said to, to Gabriel, Gabriel, go tell this man what's going on. Now, I may have missed one, but I think, I believe this is the first appearance of the angel Gabriel in Scripture. And of course, Gabriel is going to be the, the angel. The angels are just messengers of God that in Luke chapter number one is going to foretell the birth of John and appear to Mary. So this is an important messenger. So God doesn't just send Gabriel off to do any little thing. Gabriel's there to share with Daniel an important message. Now, apparently... And I've never seen an angel in person. I mean, we, we have lots of movies that try to depict these sorts of things. But apparently, he's terrifying. Because it says that he was terrified. That Daniel was shaking, there, was trembling there. Apparently, this, he, if you can imagine, you're in a vision. You've gone on the magic carpet ride in a sense. You're over there at the Uli Canal. And here comes this massive, or at least glorious angel, this other natured being that shows up to you to tell you what's going on. I'm not sure if that's worse. And it does, it seems like Daniel, 
as I might expect, you know, an interaction with the supernatural. He, he faints, he like sleeps, and Gabriel has to come and like touch him um, to restore his strength. So there's something like when you stand in the presence of God or his angels, it must just be, blow, it must just blow you away. I, but I take this, and, and there's a particular point here that I, as I was studying this, just kind of drove home to me. I believe that the Bible, God's Word here, is the inspired and inerrant Word of God has the authority for life, and it's true. We, we want to live in a world, and Peter Berger, sociologist, just explain it this way, a world without windows. Like, we have cut off everything that might be supernatural. Everything must have a rational explanation. So in the past, there have been times when humans have over-spiritualized things. All right, so there's some electricity. Well, that must be from the gods. Or if you're, you have mental illness, you, you must um, be possessed by a demon. All right, so we, we have at times over-spiritualized things. But I think now we've come to a point where actually we're over-rationalizing everything. Scripture says this, what we see and what we feel, is not all there is. And you think about all of our movies, most of our movies these days. Like, how many movies these days talk about what the concept of the metaverse? Like, this isn't just the only universe. There's an endless number of, of universes. And apparently Spider-Man's gone there. <laughs> all right, Doctor Strange has been in the metaverse. Everybody's in the metaverse. Right, but it just shows that from the very beginning of humanity, we've always longed for, all right, are there other spirits? Or where do the dead go? And our society is like, and I love science. And I think science supports scripture. And I love technology. But we want to say that this is all there is. And it's driving some of us to places of deep despair because if all, this is all there is and I just live and I try to make some money and I go through hard things and then I die, that's, that's depressing. And so scripture says, look, there is this other dimension. There is this eternal part of you. And so don't miss that. Gabriel is an angel, right? The Bible says, I mean, treats him as if he's just a person walking around. It says, Gabriel came and talked to Daniel. And so from Scripture, we know that there is this spiritual dimension. And when we come to pray before the Lord, it, it signals that we trust that. But it certainly is different from our society. Another aspect of, of this chapter, and just the more I've thought about Daniel's life, and the more that I've thought about this, this passage, it, it reminded me of a, a theme from a Star Trek episode. So the, the galaxy's about to end, and they have to go back in time to fix something. And so the, the captain of, of the vessel, the only way to do that is to get something called a time crystal. And so he goes and he gets this time crystal, but the keeper of the time crystal says there, there will be a price. If you touch it, you'll know your future. And he, well, he has to save the galaxy, so he grabs the crystal, and in his future he sees this terrible death. And so his price was the knowledge of the future. Daniel's in the same place. God has shown him the future of his people, and it's terrible. In chapter 9, we're going to study about how Daniel was reading through Jeremiah, and he knows that the time of the exile is coming to a close, and I'm sure he's hoping, he's, he's wishing, I mean, wouldn't we, if we lived in exile for 70 years in a foreign nation, and we've been faithful to God, wouldn't you long for a day when your nation was restored, restored? There was a king like David on the throne. I mean, isn't that the future? I'm sure that Daniel is hoping and wishing and praying for. And then what does God show him? Not just that there'll be another king. I mean, he's living in Babylon, which isn't too friendly, but then he's in Persia, which was friendly. But he, show, he shows him the vision of someone like Antiochus, who's going to crush his people into the ground. And so no wonder when we come to verse number 27, it says he fainted and he was sick certain days. And afterward, it says he rose up and did the king's business. And as we talked about last time, the, what God is telling Daniel is that the way home wasn't back, it was up. That it wasn't back to Jerusalem, it was up to the new Jerusalem. He had to be faithful in it. But can you imagine the weight? And you think about his life taken from his home as a teenager 
probably his family killed. We don't know that he ever went home again. He's taken into a foreign empire. He's never able to have a family. He's always at like the very brink of death. And he has to serve the very empire that, that destroyed his home. And you come to the end of his life, and here he's given this vision of the future, which to us is like, wow, wouldn't it be great to know the future? But instead, it's this terrible, terrible wait. And to that, or in response to that, what does Daniel do? It says that he, he's astonished, and he's sick, but what did he do? He rose up, and he did the king's business. Not just, the king of, not just the king of Babylon's business, but the king's business. And so against all of this weight, that is how he responded. As I was thinking about this passage's application uh, to us, uh, one of my colleagues this week, I was in Iowa, um, shared a, a really powerful devotion. The point of the devotion was, your pain is often the place that God can use, or the thing that God can use for his good. A couple of verses along those lines. It says in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 1 and through 5, For I I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with the enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of his spirit and power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. Then over in 2 Corinthians 1, it says, And your hope, uh, our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as your partakers of the suffering, so shall you also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raised the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. And so the point of, of these passages is, you think about, you know, some people portray the Christian life as, you know, everything will be great, there'll be no issue. No, Scripture actually promises us that there can be tribulation, and there can be trials, and there can be difficulties. And, and it's not just the fact that, that God allows those, or, or that we're in a broken world, but that sometimes your greatest problem, your greatest pain, is the very thing that God is going to use for his glory. It's the very thing that allows you to minister to someone else that has experienced that pain. And you think about Daniel's pain, this exile, away from his family. He's given this terrible, weighty vision of the future. But we're here thousands of years later, studying this very thing, pointing to Jesus. And Paul, he said, we're pressed on every side to the point we thought we were going to die but that's the very thing that encourages the other Christians. And, and as I was reflecting on that, let me ask you, I mean, what is your greatest source of pain? Is it a current illness? Is it something in your family? Is it a financial strain? The loss of a relationship? Unmet expectations? Cr- crushed dreams? As Christians, we can often come to God and say, take this from me, take this from me. Please, please, Change my circumstance. But Scripture's response may be, God's response may be, that's the very thing that's going to make you effective in building the kingdom. And so certainly we can pray for deliverance from these things, but we also have to to understand that sometimes that, that problem, that thing that we wake up thinking about, going to bed thinking about, is the very thing that God is encouraging us to go and minister to our, our neighbor with. You think about the passage in the, in the Gospels, where the question is, the, of, of the blind man, or of the lame man, who, who sinned? Was it the parents? Was, did he sin? And Jesus says, well, neither one of them sinned. He has this for the glory of God. And so we find Daniel, and we, we focus a lot on the prophecies in these chapters, and I, that's why I wanted to focus in on Daniel for just a minute. I mean, here he is. He's in the employ of a foreign government that destroyed his home. He's transported on this vision over into Persia and, share, and he's given a vision of this terrible future for his people. And yet, what does he do? It, it affects him terribly. But he stands back up 
and goes out to do the king's business, pointing us all the while with these prophecies to the coming of the one true king. As I close, just kind of two big takeaways for us today from chapter number eight. And I'm not sure if you saw this photo this week. All right, this is the latest photo from NASA's latest and best telescope. All right, and, and you may have seen this and pondered it already, but I thought it was worth mentioning. This is just a snapshot of a part of the sky, all right, from like a point of light. And this telescope is able to zoom in, zoom in, zoom in. And you can see all these little red dots all across. Those aren't stars. Those are galaxies. Think about looking into the heavens and seeing who God is. That with his words, he set out the entire cosmos. Well, similar, in a similar way, in this passage, I've shared with you, don't miss this, that this prophecy in the 500s, in the 6th century B.C., and Daniel is given a prophecy of events that won't happen for hundreds of years. And yet God shares with him the exact events, the exact lines of what will happen. Like, I could try to, to tell you who's going to win a football game or who's going to win the next presidential election, and I probably won't get it right. The rise and fall of nations? There's no way. Only God could do something like that. As I shared when I began the series, Daniel, and Daniel 8 through 11, one of the reasons why I'm a Christian, because only God could do that. And then the second piece, I think perhaps the one that we can really drill down on this week, is that think of the cross that you bear. Again, I've talked about that worst pain that you have. Your cross, that cross that you bear, points to the cross. And so, yes, we can pray for circumstances to change, for things to be different, but understand that it may be that that pain in your life is exactly the thing that God wants to work through for his good and his glory.